my program slideshow play from start. Can you all see that? Thank you so much. I just can't get over how wonderful it has been to have so many people supporting my work. I very much appreciate it. And you're helping me to supply the sunflower seeds to feed those 19 blue jays at the bottom of the screen. They were all crowded into my feeder at once last week. And thank you to Paula, who is the one um, who's helping let people in today. Uh, so Paula and I went to Arkansas back in 2006, and there is she and my dog, Photon. And my grandson, Walter, who's the most perfect child in the universe. And we're talking about how birds prepare for winter. There is no fish available in this woods if there's ice over the snow or under the snow. So birds can't get fish. They can't get flying insects. There are so many kinds of food that birds cannot get in winter. So they have three basic ways they can deal with that. They can get out of dodge before winter even starts. They can take it one day at a time, migrating if that seems the best thing, or not migrating if that seems the best thing, or they can stay put for the winter, but then they have to do a lot of things. Birds that get out of Dodge, meaning Duluth, Minnesota, um, all these birds are not going to stay in Duluth. Once in a while, a white-throated sparrow will, but that's a rarity. Loons can winter just as far north as Duluth, Minnesota, but they have to go on salt water for the, uh, for the winter on the vast expanse of the ocean um, to get their food and to molt their flight feathers where they won't have to fly anywhere for the duration. Uh, some birds take it one day at a time and um, will migrate if it seems right and won't migrate if that seems like the better idea. As of yesterday, over 50,000 blue jays had been counted flying, migrating over Duluth at Hawk Ridge. Uh, this year, blue jays are the number one species migrating over so far. And yet look at their range. They are found as far north in the dead of winter as they are when they're breeding. And they don't go any further south in winter than they breed. There's a little bit of area where they um, uh, once in a while will be, though they won't be breeding, but that's the exception. They, and nobody knows why. Nobody has ever figured out why blue jays migrate the way they do, but they don't need no stinking rules. Some birds stay put for the duration, no matter what, they don't migrate, except that some of those species still have individuals that move. Once in a while, we'll have a chickadee migration in Duluth, where we're actually counting them flying over Hawk Ridge or along the shore. Hairy woodpeckers once in a while, white-breasted nuthatches once in a while, even though they're not supposed to be a migratory species. It's probably a lot of young birds that didn't find a place to live for the winter yet, so they're moving around in hopes of finding a good place. For whichever approach the bird takes, whether it's going to get out of Dodge, maybe migrate, maybe not, or definitely not migrate, it needs food. That's what's gonna keep it alive. 
Now, if they eat insects, well, juicy caterpillars like that chickadee is eating are not available in Duluth in the wintertime. Meat can be available, but it has some tricks uh, involved in finding meat in the winter. They can eat seeds and they can eat fruits. These birds all need flying insects or caterpillars, and none of those are available in the winter, but those two can also eat berries. Cedar waxwings and yellow rumped warblers eat a lot of berries, and that's what can keep them much further north in the winter than vireos or kingbirds or nighthawks. These birds will eat caterpillars um, and uh, they'll eat a flying insect if they feel like chasing it, but they can also eat frozen insect eggs and frozen pupae so they can get enough insects out of trees in the dead of winter to survive, but they'll all take advantage of suet. What if you're on the paleo diet? You need to have meat. Meat-eating predators need a larger territory because there's way fewer mice than there are insects. There's way fewer rabbits than there are mice. At every step up, there's fewer prey animals, so they need a bigger territory to get enough. And the other problem is, Dead animals freeze solid, and they get literally too hard to eat, unless the birds have special adaptations. They can eat the meat while it's fresh, right after they killed it, just swallow it down. Or they can keep it thawed by sitting on it. But that little saw wet owl uh, that we saw in a field trip I was leading was sitting on a mouse, but we didn't figure it out until we saw the pictures afterward. It was just keeping it thawed till it could eat it. Or they can chip at frozen meat with a sturdy beak like this raven has. Canada jays or gray jays have a nice sturdy beak and so they can chip away at frozen meat. Some birds eat seeds in the winter. Conifer seeds are available above the snow because they're at the top of trees. So they're the easiest ones for finches to eat. That's what finches of many kinds have been adapted for eating. Weed seeds like cardinals eat get covered with snow. So until we had um, bird feeders and until the railroads cut openings in areas like between Chicago and Minneapolis, so and then would spill winter wheat or whatever they were carrying along the way, that gave cardinals an opening that they hadn't had. And that's when cardinals started expanding their range northward was in response to trains. Aren't they handsome? And they look like they belong on Christmas cards. Uh, a lot of birds eat fruit. Uh, flickers are well known as woodpeckers who specialize on ants, but they will eat a berry if they find one. Cedar waxwings eat a lot of berries. Catbirds, which go down to the tropics and the southern United States, eat fruit, but they also eat a lot of insects. Red-eyed vireos are supposed to be 100% insect eaters, but they're functionally illiterate, so they haven't read that, and they'll eat fruits too. And robins, of course, eat fruits. If they eat fruit up here, it's frozen. So if you're putting fruit out, if you have robins in a northern place and you want to feed them in the winter, sometimes they will come down to bowls of like blueberries. You don't have to buy fresh because it's going to freeze anyway, so just buy frozen blueberries. 
birds that depend on berries use them up. These tend to be nomadic species uh, that just wander from one fruit place to another. Uh, oh, I didn't put the name of uh, this bird. This is a Townsend solitaire. And this is a bohemian waxwing, and here's a robin. The solitaire is in the thrush family with the robin. And when we get one in Duluth, it's almost always by itself, which means it's living up to its name. But they uh, will sometimes find their fruit by listening for robins and uh, pine grosbeaks and bohemian waxwings. And that tells them where the fruit is. Birds have to do special things with their feathers to survive the winter. Um, they need good wing and tail feathers for flying no matter what. Now, birds with a lot of flight feathers, like this bald eagle, they don't molt all their flight feathers at once, and they don't even molt all of them every year. They molt them as the feathers get old in certain patterns. So you can see little chunks missing here and there. And the bird doesn't weigh that much so compared to the wingspan. So even if it's missing some feathers, it can stay up in the air. Common loons weigh more than golden eagles with much smaller wings. Their wings do not have really long flight feathers because that is so buoyant that they couldn't dive deep into the water to get their food. So uh, common loons don't molt any of their flight feathers until they're out on the ocean. Either uh, the ones where I live go to the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, where Holly is out west, they go to the Pacific. And there, they, if they run out of fish in one spot, they could just swim to another spot. So they can just at leisure get all new flight feathers. Birds also need feathers in winter for insulation to keep them warm. Food is the fuel they need, but if, if you think of a bird as a little cabin, it needs, ins uh, the food is like the fireplace or the furnace, but the insulation is the bird's feathers. Some birds, especially owls, have thick feathers on their eyelids and that helps hold the heat of their eyeball in their, uh, with their body. Other birds can just tuck their head with their wing over their eyes so that they don't need to have heavily feathered eyelids. Birds are terribly tiny under those feathers. Tropical birds don't need as many feathers as northern birds. So here is a comparison between a Cuban toady and a black-capped chickadee. Cuban toadies live up to their name. They're only found in Cuba. The Cuban toady is 11 centimeters long. The black-capped chickadee is 12 to 15 centimeters long. And the reason it's longer is because of its tail. Okay, so otherwise their bodies are pretty much the same size. But the Cuban toady weighs 59 grams, where the chickadee only weighs 9 to 14. It weighs six times as much. And the difference in their weight is their feathers. Underneath its feathers, the black-capped chickadee has an incredibly tiny body, where the Cuban toady, the body almost goes to the, what, what you can see. It's got a just very thin coating of feathers over it. Birds are unbelievably scrawny under their feathers, and especially their necks. Now, if you want to, under, uh, to see a dramatic view of this, my friend Eric Brunke was leading a winter bird tour and uh, they watched a great gray owl in the morning and it got hit by a car on their way back. 
And so Eric put it in, the, in his car to bring uh, so that they could have the carcass somewhere. But I weighed that carcass and my dog Pip, weighed them both. Pip weighs nine pounds. Do you know how much that great gray owl weighs? Three pounds. And it hadn't lost any body moisture because it had just been hit by the car. It was still warm when Eric picked it up. And Pip is smaller. It's all feathers around that bird. And feathers are literal featherweights. So birds have to prepare for winter. Birds have to molt before the cold weather sets in. And that's what this blue jay, uh, I know this individual blue jay because it poses for pictures for me and then I give it peanuts. So I know that I'm looking at the exact same bird in these two pictures. Chickadees put on all their feathers at the, uh, starting in July, as parents finish up with their babies, they start molting, they look horrible, and then they look stunning. But they have to grow all new feathers to do that. Golden crown kinglets weigh almost half what chickadees weigh. They're smaller but not that much smaller. That's how thick their body feathers are. Their feathers weigh about 8% of what their body weight is. And that's very comparable to how much an Arctic explorer's clothing weighs. I took uh, this picture today, so I had to throw it in. He was looking at me through my office window and he was a little cooperative, but not very. So this is the picture I took on August 7th of my bald blue jay, and here's the exact same bird last week. And they have to spend a lot of time in fall preening in order to get that gorgeous and make sure each feather uh, opens up properly. And this is the payment that particular blue jay gets for posing for me. The farther you north you go, the longer the winter nights are, as well as the colder it is. Birds spend their short winter days preparing for the long winter nights. They spend most of their winter sleeping or pretending to sleep. Uh, this owl is actually looking at me while I was taking that picture. You could hardly see its eye is just open a slit, but their vision is very clear when their eye is just open a slit. When we just have our eyes open a slit, we, um, everything looks kind of fuzzy, but that's not the way it is for owls. So golden crown kinglets cannot spend a single minute of the day not looking for food. And they start dying, uh, uh, serious die-offs if the temperature gets down to minus 40. And when I say minus 40, that is minus 40 centigrade or it's minus 40 Fahrenheit. That's the exact temperature where the two scales cross. So where do birds spend those long winter nights? That's part of what they have to spend fall preparing for. Chickadees excavate little cavities to sleep in or find abandoned woodpecker holes or things or use birdhouses. And other birds build their own cavities. This is a red-bellied woodpecker and a pileated and a downy. And here's what that cavity looks like inside. This is a downy woodpecker's nest cavity. This picture is from my book, Into the Nest. Um, but I just want you to see that the hole that they make in the tree is not what the cavity is. That's just the doorway. And then there's a whole room beneath. 
downy woodpeckers that make those extraordinary cavities will also use a birdhouse sometimes or steal somebody else's cavity if somebody steals theirs. Some birds need cavities, but they cannot build their own no matter what, like European starlings and house sparrows and pigeons and owls, like this adorable northern sawhead owl. And just because I have some cool photos, I'm going to show you the only warbler that nests in a cavity, which it cannot make. Uh, the only eastern warbler in the southwest, there's also Lucy's warbler. But in the east, the prothonotary warbler nests in tree cavities or birdhouses. And a pair nested in this tea kettle for at least three years running. This was on the Mississippi River in Trempolo, Wisconsin, or La Crosse, I can't remember which one. And they produced eggs every year, and the eggs hatched every year, and the hatchlings grew healthy every year and fledged every year. And those pictures are from my friend Scott Lee, but I got to see that nest and it was really cool to watch. And the reason they could be in a tea kettle, which doesn't have a lid, is because there was a roof overhead. Now, some of the critters who use cavities are not birds, like this mouse or this flying squirrel at my bird bath last week. And I just have to show you the video. He's drinking and I have a, a trail cam on him and it glows a red light. And that's why his eyes look so spooky. But when he comes around, you'll be able to see his kind of flowing sides that he can expand his legs to um, jump off. And now he's gonna jump the end. Wasn't that adorable? <laughs> If someone takes over your cavity, like a flying squirrel or a mouse or a starling um, or some other bird, um, or, you, or the tree falls down, you have an emergency. Uh, or in this case, the pileated woodpecker probably has a cavity. This was taken on a sunny but frozen uh, afternoon. And my friend Eileen Benson took this picture and, um, it probably, the cavity was probably colder than sitting out in the open with the sun on him when he wanted to take a nap. So, but my uh, Paula, our co host tonight, took these pictures. Uh, a black capped chickadee found a little spot to sleep on her porch. And here it is at nighttime right above that chain, it just was sound asleep there. And that's any port in a storm, something must have taken away its cavity. Um, saw what owls are supposed to roost in cavities, but if they can't find one, if they've had to wander and they haven't found an open one yet, they'll sleep in a sheltering, the sheltering branches of a tree, or sometimes they're not that sheltered, they just need sleep. Now these birds have a special, uh, their feathers fade when they get a lot of sun. Um, and I'll show you that, I, but I'm not gonna show you saw what, I'm gonna show you another cavity nesting owl, the boreal owl. A whole bunch of them died during one year. And one of my friends was examining all the carcasses in the spring. And he could look at the bird's wing and tell how old it was when they the year they hatch all their feathers are new and so if they faded at all they've all faded at the same rate when they're one year old they've molted some of their feathers which are fresh but some are old still and have faded more and this is subtle to see, especially at nighttime in a banding station when they want to figure out how old a sawhead owl is. Uh, here's one that's in its third or beyond after they've molted once all their feathers. Now they're going to molt them uh, like if one drops out or they'll molt them in little sections so it's not as easy to see. 
but it's easier to see which feathers are faded and which aren't if they use a black light. One of the pigments our eyeballs can't see, but we can see under a black light, uh, is the very pigment that is in their feathers, and it will make the, the fresh new feathers look bright pink, where the old faded ones have lost that pigment. And this is an important thing probably for the owls to use. They can see in those wavelengths. And if they, a male or a female looking for a mate is going to see how well it's kept on its pigments. Uh, so it wouldn't be maybe quite as white as this bottom one is. Um, in the big patch, it would be, in here, uh, if it's a little pinker, then maybe the bird is better at always getting cavities in the daytime because what makes the feather feathers fade is sunlight. And um, so now I had to show you a healthy, happy boreal owl to make up for those tragic dead ones. Some birds don't use cavities they nest either in thick branches of trees or under a literal blanket of snow. Ruffed grouse can go either way. If they find a nice dense conifer, they might sleep in that, if, uh, especially before we get snow. But once the snow is deep, they can actually dive into it and um, be covered up for the night snow uh, until it gets, you know, it actually insulates them from the below zero temperatures uh, above the snow. If they're by the ground under the snow, the temperature may be more in the 20s. Snow buntings will also plunge into the snow, as will common red poles sometimes, or they'll be on a branch. And some of them snuggle together for warmth. Brown creepers will find a cavity, and you could have 30 of them in a cavity. Not this far north. We only will have a few over winter. Red-breasted nuthatches can gather together, but chickadees do not gather with other chickadees. They do not share their body warmth. The only time of year you can get a picture like this with chickadees crowded together at a feeder is when you have baby chickadees that are still in their original family unit. That's what these guys are. They're just by themselves. They're very sociable. They're the Norwegian bachelor farmers of the bird world, so they like other chickadees, but they need to keep their personal distance. Oops, have to throw that in just for fun. That's Walter. Birds have very high body temperatures compared to mammals. An American robin's normal temperature is between 104 and 108. That's when a fever becomes very dangerous for a person. A mute swan. I don't know how they got 105.8. That's pretty precise, but they probably just measured one bird. A golden crown kinglet's body temperature is 110 degrees, and it's that same temperature at nighttime while they're sleeping. Where a black capped chickadee, the body temperature is about 108, but they can turn down the thermostats so they can, uh, that gives them a little bit better shot at survival overnight, is turning down the thermostat. That's why chickadees over winter way further north than golden crown kinglets do. To generate that body heat, the birds shiver, which takes extra fuel. Fuel is food. Some birds have to find fresh food every day. They don't store food anywhere. They have to find it that day. Some birds store food for the future. And let's look at them one by one. Let's look at this Canada Jay. They get chunks of food, cache them into bark of trees, 
and coat them with saliva, which acts as sort of a little bit of a food preservative. They look so fluffy and sweet while they're getting chunks of food and they carry them off and hide them. This is a cache for a Canada Jay. One of the reasons they do this, they start in fall. They're doing it right now up here in Duluth. Well, not in Duluth, but in the woods beyond Duluth, is that they nest in the dead of winter. This is a bird on its nest on eggs. They can minimize the time they're off the nest because they don't need to be hunting, but also that gives them food to feed their babies. Their babies are full size. They're this wonderful charcoal color, but look at the leaves on this tree. They're just starting to open. Uh, this is still early spring. And the problem, Canada Jays have a problem that um, they cannot handle climate change. Uh, uh, the Living Bird magazine of Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, had this article in it a couple years ago. Can they survive warmer weather? Because when they cache their food away, their saliva isn't perfect. It starts rotting when it gets thawed. And in Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada, their population has declined 50% since 1977 because we get thaws in winter which rot their food. They call it hoard rot. And if you look at this map, the, the more babies, oops, they can produce more babies when the temperature is lower and fewer babies as the temperature gets up. If the average temperature is three degrees, the brood size goes down. And um, it's just been really dramatic and clear and depressing. Um, but they still live and this guy uh, is holding a 17 year old uh, Canada J that he had banded and he banded it year after year after year. I think he was in Colorado. But aren't they adorable? And Blue Jays store food for the winter, but they also, like Canada Jays, all these birds will take fresh food, but they also depend on stores when there's storms or just such a bad cold spell that they can't spend a lot of time searching for food. They want to keep it, um, they want to have some food hidden away. Now, I told you we had 50,000 birds counted at Hawk Ridge, which is right above my house. And um, they would come to my theater, but I have some Blue Jays who are gonna spend the winter. Local Blue Jays are using my theater as a grocery store. They take food and they store it. I don't know that my husband really likes the idea of Blue Jays storing food by our electrical um, meter, but they are. They have a grocery bag right on their throat to stuff with seeds and then hide them to eat somewhere else and to, or to eat them later. This one's got a little bit in his or her Gueller pouch. But the ones migrating through use the feeder as a restaurant. They're not carrying away food, they're just pigging out because then they're gonna have to travel again. And the local Jays will join them in the restaurant for a while. And I have to show you, Blue Jays are one of my favorite birds, but they can be very rude. When they eat a sunflower seed, they have to work really hard to open it all the way before they can pull the seed out. Um, chickadees don't have to open the seed, they crack a tiny hole in. So here flew in a baby Blue Jay, and it didn't know anything except it was watching his technique, but watch this one. He's like, what happened? 
that guy just stole his seed after he'd opened it, which is pretty darn intelligent, even though it's also pretty darn rude. <laughs> Okay, northern shrikes are called the butcher bird because they actually have what it works as a meat locker. When they kill animals, they impale them on thorns or barbed wire or whatever they find, and then they have a nice, thick, sturdy bill to chip into it if it gets frozen. So here's a poor little dead. Um, some little mousy thing. And here's Ryan Brady. He banded this northern shrike in 2006. And year after year after year, this individual shrike kept returning to the same area for the winter. And so he was getting it year after year after year. And in 2013, he captured it again, so it was still alive, and it had been an adult when he originally banded it. Um, I took this picture at a distance, and that was the last year he saw the shrike. We don't know for sure that it died or whether it found a new territory, but the probability is that it didn't live beyond that. Black-capped chickadees also store a lot of food. The trick with hiding food is you have to remember where you hid it, and their food items are tiny, and they have to remember where they hid all of them. Now, people used to look at bird brains and think they were stupid compared to mammals. That's why we even have the expression bird brain, because we always thought all that folding in our brain meant we were smarter than birds. But birds are smarter than you think. And they can remember not just where they hid the food, but they can remember where reliable good feeding places are, like my house. And they just look in and wait for me to feed them. But what if you've memorized every single crevice of a birch tree, where you've hidden your food, where it might be good next year for making a cavity, and then it gets struck by lightning. They have tiny brains. A chickadee only weighs a third of an ounce. You can mail three of them with a single postage stamp, and their brain is a tiny part of that third of an ounce. So, and they can live for over 12 years. So, their brains cannot be clogged with stupid memories the way mine is. I still remember the words to every word of the song to the Beverly Hillbillies, and that is doing me no good whatsoever. Uh, chickadees don't waste their time with stuff like that. They actually erase, delete old files that are worthless and their brain mass decreases at the end of summer where they've deleted, where they've actually allowed neurons to die and they grow new ones to form new memories. And they still hang on to memories that might still be useful. When I took my job at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I stopped feeding my backyard chickadees for three winters. And then I came home and some of the chickadees were immediately coming back to my window for me to feed them. They remembered over all that time. And this is my friend Val Cunningham and she had a cool question for me. She wants to know why smaller birds need more energy to stay warm in the cold than larger birds. And size matters. Like I said, that little golden crown kinglet, it has to spend 100% of its minutes each day getting food. Chickadees could take a break to sing for a little bit because they're bigger than golden crown kinglets. Okay, so chickadees are actually sort of spherical under their, without their beak or their tail, 
They're almost a little golf ball. Uh, but we're going to pretend that they're cubic. And we're going to say this cube is a chickadee, is a chickadee. Okay, the mass of the cube is how much the chickadee weighs, and the surface area, those six sides, are how fast it loses its heat. And if you want to understand that, I had to get Ulysses S. Grant into this program, and this is his childhood home, but it's sort of cubicle. And where does it lose heat? Out the walls and the roof. It doesn't lose heat in the center of the house, it's on the surface. And so, blue jays, a blue jay weighs about the same as eight chickadees. So there's eight cubes there, but they're all together. And that means that some of those faces are on the inside where it's not losing heat. So the chickadee cube has six small square faces. That's its surface area where the chickadee loses its heat. The blue jay has 24 square faces. So its surface area is about the same as four chickadees, but it weighs eight times as much. In other words, it has as much heat as eight chickadees, but it's uh, the fraction of heat it's losing every minute is only half of what the chickadee's losing. Ravens weigh about the same as 64 chickadees, and their surface area is only 96 of those small squares. So it's about the same as 16 chickadees. So the fraction of heat a raven loses every minute is only a quarter of what a chickadee loses. All this means that relative to its body weight, a chickadee has to eat about twice as much as a blue jay each day, or four times as much as a common raven. And that's just for its body weight. Now, one guy came up with a rule uh, to reduce their surface area, animals living in cold climates have shorter limbs and body appendages because where it sticks out, that blue jay's beak is losing heat. Now the Canada jay's beak is almost as long, but it's covered with feathers. So it's staying insulated and it's not losing as much body heat through its bill. And you could look at these maps and tell that the Canada jay can survive way further north than the blue jay can. And the blue jay is more adapted to being way further south than the Canada jay is. But now here's the, an exception. These rules that scientists come up with always have exceptions. Look at that schnoz on the raven. Now, yeah, it's covered with feathers, but why does it have such a thick beak sticking out of his face? It's because I told you he's eating frozen carcasses and he has to be able to chip away at them. Bergman had a rule in related warm-blooded animals, larger species or populations of the same species tend to be found in colder areas and smaller species or populations in warmer areas. And that's true between the crow and the raven, as you saw in the map. The ra uh, ravens can go way the heck up. Crows in the furthest north that they live uh, have to migrate south in the winter. But the downy and the hairy woodpecker, it's not quite so clear. Yeah, hairies go a little bit further north, but they also go much further south. So it's rules are made to be broken. Even well-trained dogs break rules. This is my daughter's dog, Muxy, and my dog, Pip. Muxy is a New York City dog. She gets cold and has to wear a jacket when it's 40 above zero, where Pip she doesn't need to have a jacket at all. She loves going out in the cold too, which makes no sense. And speaking of dogs, I wanted to make sure we had a lot of time for questions. 
Next time, I'm going to talk about woodpeckers on November 1st. And in December, we're going to talk about bird brains. And I want you all to stay safe and well. And who has any questions? So now we have to figure out how to open it up to participants. So stop share. And I will put this over here. And so now we can un um Paula, do you know how to make any of them? I think everybody could unmute themselves. Yes, okay. Cool. Yeah. So any questions? I think there's a couple in the chat box. One from Charlotte to everyone. Do you see it? Not yet. Oh, uh, let me see. I, yeah, I found Charlotte's. When your bald blue jay regrows its plumage, is its feather pattern the same as before it molted? Yes. Uh, blue jays, um, some people think or say, or maybe actually can, recognize individual blue jays by plumage, but I cannot at all. I recognize that one individual that I call Blue Steel because it's blue and that's the name of Ben Stiller's um, model in Zoolander uh, who poses so uh, dramatically. Um, but they look the same except handsome again uh, after they get their new feathers. Um, and uh, so, uh, so yeah, the pattern is the same. Uh, and uh, Susan said that they do age. Uh, she's the one um, in St. Louis, Missouri, which is in St. Louis County. And they caught a saw wet owl there a couple of years ago now, or last year, who had originally been banded here in St. Louis County, Minnesota. And just by a coincidence, they named him Frankie except the name of the guy who banded it was Frank Nicoletti. Uh, but they use black light to age them at night. Um, and that it's just much, much easier to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some reason, I mean, we actually have photographs. The, they molt those feathers in a predictable pattern at certain mm -hmm. ages. Yeah. So we have the black light in our little room and we take a picture of the wing and then compare it to the pictures of the known age birds to figure it out. That's so cool. Um, and she also found a peanut plant in her rose bed, which had grown from a peanut in the shell. And she said that some bird forgot its location. Well, that's kind of jumping to a conclusion because some birds get killed before they can retrieve all their food and birds hide a lot more food than what they need. Blue jays are credited with replanting oak forests as glaciers subsided. Plants uh, like birch trees, the seeds blow and so they can go a certain distance. Blue jay uh, acorns drop. So acorns end up right by the oak tree where they came, except blue jays could carry them miles away and cache them. And they can't eat all the food that they store. And so those grew back. And, um, and started the forest before any of the wind-blown seeds could do. Isn't that cool? But mm -hmm. it could be a forgetful blue jay who hit it too. But I always have to speak for the bird. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what other questions? Mm. Oh, what is the best food to put out for birds during the winter? It all depends on what birds you want to see. I use live mealworms in my window feeder 
for my chickadees. A lot of birds would eat live mealworms, but they are really expensive. <laughs> and um, so I don't use them except for my chickadees and the random red breasted that had two figures it out. But um, uh, the best single seed is probably sunflower. Are you in the middle of something? Why? Oh, uh, oh, I'm through talking to Sarah. Okay. So um, she'll talk to you later. Okay. I told her I would got my jam. Anyway, um, does that sound Sunflower seed comes in two different forms, black oil or striped. The black oil has thin shells that are oh so easy to open. And chickadees, when they eat it, they just peck a little hole in the shell. And then they start taking out little bits of the sunflower seed. So they don't have to spend all their time hacking it away to get it out the way poor blue jays do and for another blue jay to steal. They that was so rude. But um, because they're so easy to crack open, uh, they're easy for starlings to eat, uh, house sparrows, and um, quote the riffraff. And so if people are getting blackbirds and don't want to be feeding them their sunflower seed, but want their cardinals to keep coming or their uh, chickadees, then by the striped sunflower seed. It's much harder and trickier to um, uh, to open up. I use white millet right now that I scatter on the ground in the morning and then it's gone by the end of the day because I have so many white-throated sparrows because otherwise I've had a rat coming into the yard. So uh, I've had to um, stop just indiscriminately scattering it. Uh, but my uh, migratory sparrows are the ones who mainly go for the white millet. I use suet for, and I buy the suet cakes from Wild Birds Unlimited that they call super suet because a whole bunch of birds like that. I get pileated woodpeckers and chickadees and even my purple finches once in a while are taking that and my pine siskins. I, they're functionally illiterate so they didn't realize they're not supposed to eat it. Um, during, uh, those are the main things in uh, the winter that I'm using. Um, I used to get my live mealworms from a place called Grubco and I'd order them by mail. I really needed high quantities of them when I was rehabbing birds, but I don't um, go through nearly as many anymore and uh, Grubco went out of business. I think rainbow mealworms did too. So now I just buy them in small containers from Wild Birds Unlimited. Uh, if you don't have a wild bird feeding store, uh, there's a few chains and then some individual stores near you. They also often sell mealworms at bait shops, but that means you have to have a fishing place near you too. Um, what causes finch eruptions in the winter? Well, that's because finches are sort of designed for eating the seeds out of cones. And different, um, in different areas of the country, depending on the weather and depending on the previous year's cone production, some trees will just be producing so many cones and some won't be producing hardly any cones at all, and the finches move to where the cones are. Uh, red crossbills are very dependent on pine cones, and so they will be where pines have a lot of seeds. Uh, red crossbills, 50% of them have the bill, the, the right bill crossing over the left bill and 50% have the left bill crossing over the right bill. Hmm. And so they hang on a cone and pull out the seeds. They have to use one side of their face 
depending on whether they're right build or left build. And so they're pulling the seeds out. And because it's 50-50, some birds have the angle to get some seeds, some birds have the angle to get the other seeds, and it's really well shared. But I forget whether it's right over left or left over right, but one of those ways is dominant genetically, like brown eyes and blue eyes. And with humans, there's no compelling reason to have 50% of people have brown eyes and 50% have blue eyes. But with red crossbills, there is a good reason, So, but they're using up all the food. There's no compelling reason for white-winged crossbills to go one way over, you know, to make it 50-50, because what they're eating are the uh, the uh, seeds out of spruce cones and tamarack cones and all these little cones that just fall out of the tree anyway. So half the time they hold it in their foot and they can turn it however they want. So 80% of white wing crossbills, it crosses one way and only 20% does it cross the other way. And just to check that out, when I worked at the Cornell Lab, I went down to their collection museum and pulled out the drawers and counted them mm -hmm. on the white winged and on the, the red crossbill specimens. And it was shocking that it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, uh, where can we get white millet? Um, that you can get at bird feeding stores. That's what I always get at Wild Birds Unlimited and they often run out of it. And so she has to order it special for me. Um, but uh, it's an ideal food for these little sparrows, but white millet, that they often throw red millet in those bird seed mixes. And I strongly recommend that you not buy grocery store seed mixes because a lot of it is what you call filler seed so you're paying by the pound but only a fraction of the pound is actually stuff birds will eat and it's not only that you're paying too much but what the birds don't eat gets spoiled and in the end of the winter, that's when we start getting botulism outbreaks or salmonella in pine siskins and red poles. And it's because of all the, the rotted seed and bird poop that's accumulated all winter. But you want to minimize that by not buying stuff that the birds aren't going to eat. Do I recommend spreading peanut butter on pine cones and hanging them for birds in winter? Sure. Also, you can smear, if you're too lazy to go find pine cones, or if you have a red squirrel in your yard stealing every single cone it can get, I have no idea where it's hiding them, but it's, I've watched it take at least 100, and I'm, and I'm only watching it very little. But um, I don't bother with the um, putting it on cones, I just smear it into a couple spots on a tree trunk on the bark. And my uh, father-in-law a long time ago got a nice long birch branch and um, drilled in holes about this big and about an inch deep. And I pack those with peanut butter. In the winter, there's no problem with uh, it getting too sticky or anything. Um, and I use the cheap, uh, don't buy a cheap generic peanut butter and make sure it has not been sweetened with what's the thing, xylocaine or uh, xyla something um, that they put in that makes things sugar free but sweet because that can kill dogs and it's probably not good for birds. So make sure if it's got a sweetener at all, it's either sugar or uh, at the worst, um, you know, corn, um, high, high glucose corn or sucrose corn or whatever it is. Um, but um, yeah, I use peanut butter and my birds love it. Uh, and the only times I've ever had brown creeper, uh, not brown creepers, boreal chickadees at my feeder. It's always been to peanut butter. And if you ever get to go to the Saxon bog in the wintertime, 
you'll get to see boreal chickadees at the peanut butter. That's what they love. Do bluebirds winter over in the Northeast? Um, they, uh, they have kind of a variable migration, and I'm sure some of them spend the whole winter there. In the Midwest, uh, we're more often going to get an outlier mountain bluebird than an eastern bluebird, and it'll just be one lost individual. But in the Northeast, I think some of them do overwinter. Um, Suzanne French uses hulled white millet and she throws it on top of the snow for the juncos. Oh, and juncos are one of those sparrows that eat them. Uh, they haven't come back in full force here yet. Oh, xylitol. Thank you, Kathy Mai. Um, xylitol is the bad thing you do not want in your peanut butter. Oh, okay. Oh. So, um, any other questions? I'm taking these all off the chat. <laughs> oh, somebody asked me about my necklace. Uh, this came from Cuba. I was actually going to bring it up when I was talking about the Cuban toady. Um, and what it is, is um, silver, silverware. The old stuff from back when there were a lot of wealthy people in Cuba and when they fled, um, they left behind stuff and um, a, a wonderful jeweler there fashioned this out of a fork and a spoon, the tools of female empowerment in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Men get the knives, but women get the forks and spoons. So we're the ones who actually get to eat. And um, then it's got coral in it. And she makes the design and her father is the one who actually does the welding and all that stuff. And I got to meet the artist, so of course I had to buy it. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it was actually affordable. I think I paid $60 for it, which mm -hmm. makes it one of my most expensive pieces of jewelry, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. one that I love. <laughs> right, right. That was so interesting, Laura, with the uh, um, Canadian jays and their saliva, and and sad though that it's the weather change, uh, climate change is making it um, dangerous for them to um, live in the same area. Yeah. Oh, um, Kathy uh, Nieder had a question. Uh, can I talk about corn in feed? She's been avoiding corn because of GMO. Uh, the reason I avoid corn is because there are two things that um, when they get wet, start to mold that produce um, uh, a toxin. And corn is one and um, it's the other. Anyway, it, it molds and uh, it can be very toxic for birds, the, the toxin that the fungus produces. So I tend to not use corn because of that. Uh, the issue of GMOs is complicated. Uh, as far as nutrition goes, there's absolutely no issue. Uh, but the problem with GMOs is that sometimes um, that has changed um, ecosystems and um, like uh, more of a lot of pesticides are used in GMO where GMOs are designed to uh, make the corn resistant so that they can use the pesticides to um, solve weeds or insects. So, so, but I tend to avoid the corn because of the, um, I'm trying to remember what the uh, yucky, I forgot xylitol tonight, now I can't remember that, but anyway. Gly glycophate or gly yeah, oh, yeah. something like that? Glycosate uh, or? That's one of the, you know, 
it's a weird thing because a lot of the pesticides have been so valuable in a lot of ways for increasing food production and all kinds of things. But and Rachel Carson never spoke against using pesticides. She spoke about using them as much as people were doing mm. because um, it, the, the exact same issue with pesticides is true of uh, antibiotics, that they are very important when you need them, but when you overuse them, the very things you're trying to kill develop resistance. So it needs to be really tightly managed. So it's only used as a last resort, certainly not a first resort. So uh, yeah, I think it is aspergillus. And what about feeding raw beef fat in the winter when it would not spoil? Is that a good source of fat? Um, the raw beef suet, which is actually the fat in a particular area of the cow, uh, is what people always fed birds for a long, long time. And then they started using bacon fat and bacon trimmings. I don't recommend that because that has the nitrates in it. Um, but yeah, beef fat, and um, if you cook it, if you render the suet, you can uh, skim off any of the impurities, and then it will be stay fresh, like those suet cakes, uh, where you could actually feed them in the summer. But the raw beef fat in the winter, when it won't spoil, you, you don't have to render it, and yeah, it's just fine. That used to be what butchers gave away for free because nobody used it uh, except for bird feeding but now you have to pay for everything <laughs> for your next talk i recall seeing a woodpecker eating off of a deer carcass was in the winter well if you've seen them eating on the suet feeder mm -hmm. they're getting the same thing right yeah. uh, do you remember what kind of woodpecker it was Oh, probably a downy. Yeah. Um, one of my friends wanted to photograph, get close up photos of turkey vultures. And he found out where one of the northern Minnesota counties was dumping all the deer carcasses during the winter and went there in the spring in hopes of getting great turkey vulture pictures during migration. Except what he got all the great pictures of were warblers and chickadees eating the maggots on the deer. And then um, I think he got some woodpeckers and things eat, and then jays eating the meat. But he never did get a turkey vulture. <laughs> but he was not expecting the warblers eating the maggots. Tell me if I remember this correctly. I've, I've been to Duluth for birding in the winter twice, but it's been quite a few years ago. And we saw chickadees on the the rib cage, you know, the deer rib cage. I mean, oh yeah, actually nailed them up on the tree. And I'd never thought about chickadees as eating meat or any of that. So that was kind of a surprise. Yeah, um, uh, chickadees would eat a lot of meat if that was a food they they can't kill the animal first. And they don't usually stick, you know, get in there with a predator who killed something. But in the winter, when they set out these carcasses, it's just like when we set out suet. Uh, you know, that carcass has a lot of fat on it, and it's got meat, which is protein, and chickadees, any protein in a storm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, if you ever have a chance to come up to northern Minnesota in the winter to the bog, we have a visitor center and several feeding stations throughout this vast expanse of a bog. And they'll tell you at the visitor center, people write down on the outside on a chalkboard or, or a whiteboard or something, or you go inside and they tell you what's around. Um, usually there's great gray owls. Often there's northern hawk owls. Last year there was a boreal owl every day for weeks. Um, 
and they're easy to find and they know which feeder boreal chickadees are most likely to be coming to. There's one feeder that always has evening gross beaks, but there's several places where they put out these deer carcasses for ones that have been killed by cars or sometimes hunters will save uh, the rib cage or something for, uh, for us. And they just put them out in different places. So we've had uh, weasels coming to them and sometimes um, a Fisher or Martin, I can't remember which one. Um, and then all kinds of birds go to them. Uh, any bird that eats suet will go to a rib cage. And that's what some of my pictures of the gray jays tonight were from. Well, thanks again for a wonderful program. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. We didn't have as many people as last time, did we? Uh, but it was still good. One, I think. Hmm? How many? About 61 or 62. Yeah, so that means I didn't have to spend the extra $50. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm paying $50 a month to be able to have 100 people. Uh, because if you get to 100, they kick people out. But that's why I said you could invite your friends because we have plenty of room. Cool. Cool. And next time I'll try to stay a little more organized um, at the beginning and have my voice working. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was great, Laura. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thanks so much, Sam. Give Walter a hug from his Auntie Donna. I and do. give Pip a tummy rub. I have to go find out what my husband's up to. Bye bye. Thank you. Doug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Laura. It was great it. to see a picture of Pip too. <laughs> I've heard all about him. Lots Her. of water. She's Her. named for a boy, but she's a girl. She's a girl. <laughs> I'm sorry. A female, female. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And my and my dog's just gone into her her kennel just now and not bothering me after a half hour bothering me. So <laughs> well, Pip's been in her little dog house this whole time right under me. Um, mm -hmm. she, she freaks out if I don't let her in the room. So I can, I can understand that. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Laura. Thanks.